My pleasure to um, introduce Mabasha Rizri, who is Assistant Professor of Cultural Anthropology at Georgetown. And I'm about to pass on the most impossible task of the day, which um, second only to trying to teach Africa, um, <laughs> we'll try to teach Asia. And um, Asia is one of the ones that shows up on the Mercator maps as like really big already, but, um, but it's extremely diverse. So um, his teaching and research interests range from ethnography of social movements, historical anthropology, environmental anthropology, and post-colonial theory. So uh, in addition to research in South Asia, Dr. Ruthie is interested in how Muslim youth negotiate the politics of race in Europe and America. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you to all of you for being here today on Saturday, and for all the work you do, because if it wasn't for you guys, I mean, my, I still remember about Miss Marks Ellis, my global studies teacher in high school, and um, she was the only person who made me believe that I, one could go study social science and history from an immigrant family, you don't have to be an engineer only. So that was a very formative time in 10th, 11th grade, where a lot of uh, pressures are on students on which way to go, especially in immigrant families, that was wonderful. So here is Asia, as big as it gets, as you said, it's somewhat represented accurately, maybe, or not, because we know how maps get I mean, how do you teach this region as one, right? 4.4 uh, billion, 60% of world's humanity, 30% of the land mass, just largest continent, 48 countries, so many languages. Um, in that sense, it's kind of a very interesting question that this entire region can be part of an area of studies. And for most departments and for most universities, you rarely will have um, a very interesting, intersecting, cross-regional program. Often it's subdivided as it is here within the range of expertise. So at Georgetown, you'll find a lot of the Asian studies classes are mostly focused on East Asia, sometimes they're on the Korean Peninsula, and if you go to some place like UT Austin, where I was trained, there's a, most of the Asian Studies courses are focusing on South Asia, right? Uh, um, and then each and every subfield has its own kind of intellectual tradition that has emerged. Uh, so, for instance, Southeast Asia, people are familiar with, you know, um, Benedict Anderson's work on nationalism, really emerges from our literature from Southeast Asia. A lot of the Central Asia work is kind of focusing on post-socialist life now, or if not, pre-historical work on pastoral communities. In that sense, it is, each and every region has a certain kind of subfield in terms of um, thematic themes that they have specialized in, more or less. And in East Asia, certainly in the last few years, there's been a lot more interest in economic globalization, right? Uh, so you will have one department where you have people who do contemporary ethnographies on what it means to eat in a McDonald's in Bombay, right? In, within a particular kind. And then you have the same, they might have a colleague who's really looking at the ancient Hindu legal texts, right? In terms of, so it just kind of, you have classicists and you have people doing contemporary work. In some ways, it's a very odd thing, but I think in some ways it can be also a very productive way if one approaches it in an interdisciplinary way. So in that sense, that's, that's how I see the field of Asian studies. Very interdisciplinary, but at the same time, broken down to regions and struggling to find ways in which how it can reach out towards other regions in a thematic, find common themes. So one of the things me and Susan were talking about, this is something Susan works on, which is uh, has an excellent teaching resource, the website on Indian Ocean History, which really is connecting you with the region of, and I have the question of Western Asia and Middle East as a question mark, really, why not? Well, it's really interesting why that does not get considered part of Western Asia. Who makes it at the Middle East, middle of what East? From which perspective do we look at it? As teachers, we all know that. But in some ways, it's really interesting how regions slip into a certain slot and slip out of a certain slot. I work on Pakistan, which is historically been considered very much part of South Asia. But since post 9-11, there's a certain kind of regional re rethinking about what Pakistan is and where it belongs. There was this coinage of a term called AFTAC. I don't know if you're familiar with that, of Pakistan for a while. That kind of got some traction in Washington, DC. And now there's more and more of an attempt to kind of couple it within the East. And I'm not, a lot of South Asian scholars and Pakistani scholars are very 
concerned and, and worried. I'm not worried. I mean, certainly, it doesn't matter if it is this way or that way, depending on the kind of critical lens that you're bringing into it. There is this idea that it becomes too much dominated by the idea of religion and Islam when it gets associated with the Middle East, as opposed to the kind of heterogeneity uh, of what is South Asia and kind of local ideas of Islam. So there is this kind of tension, at, if you will, in terms of how to construct South uh, Asian studies. But one of the interesting things that I see, um, a study of Asian studies that could be really rich for high school students, it was certainly for me, was to really rethink how we think about globalization and global connections in a much more historical way. For instance, you know, a lot of the tropes around kind of history and themes in Latin American history are so much about the Colombian exchange and the encounter of colonialism. And you have the pre-Columbian history and you have the post kind of contact histories. But in Asia, you have this constant mixing of uh, layers and layers of global histories, uh, ways in which, uh, so on the right hand, for example, just to give you an artifact or an object to think about, is a, a Gandharan statue that you often find in northern parts of Pakistan. And, and it, what it reflects is a very Greco-Roman form of sculpture, but it is also very much formed in what is today Pakistan, in particularly. And the region and the city-state that was sculpted in Takshila was a center of Buddhist learning in, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I don't have the time period, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't want to be wrong, but you know, the wrong time period. But one of the interesting things is a region, a hill remote place, uh, about 60 kilometers north of Islamabad today, was where the Japanese emperor-to-be would come for training, for education, right, in Buddhist teachings, right, at that particular moment in history. And it's a very rich way of looking at regions which today seem very isolated, are very much specific in a particular kind of slot, and how they have been kind of connected both by this kind of Athenian, Roman, but also Buddhist, um, the way in which, how, and it kind of shifts our ideas of how we can think about the possibilities of what is diversity in a particular way. And those imaginaries are not only some things that are remote and historical, they're also informing how different parts of the world are imagining the future which is also important for our students to be as kind of global thinkers. So what I'm, on the next to that uh, Ganhara uh, Buddha statue, which has very kind of Athenian uh, uh, form in terms of its, the way in which it's sculpted, in terms of the techniques that were brought in from this mix, you have what is the imaginary of the new Silk Road from China, which is trying to re-invoke that world vis-a-vis -vis large infrastructure projects that China is pumping a lot of money into within countries like Pakistan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan. And you know, I'm not interested in the kind of geopolitics, but I'm more also interested in the imaginary of how certain kind of history of Silk Road history is being used to rethink a larger global from a very different perspective. And so what it, this project is trying to do is trying to create both land and uh, sea kind of roots in a large, um, uh, how would you say, kind of a larger radius of connections of global trade, globality in a certain kind of way. So, you know, one of the major points of this project right now is very controversial in Pakistan, which is construction, which I'll get to, dam projects, rails, and port projects, vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan from Western China, which takes one into that kind of Persian Gulf, but also connects it to Central Asia and all around. So you have the land, rail, uh, links and then you have the sea ports connecting all of this as a new form of 21st century um, Silk Road that is emergent and it's very much based on this kind of historical memory of a certain kind of connection that had existed basically. So that's one of the ways in which one can start thinking about Asian studies as rethinking what is the global and global connectivity in a different way from how we think thought about it only from 1492 onwards, right? So you're thinking about it in a kind of a different way. Um, another aspect of it is this kind of ideas that we are grappling with all the time uh, as uh, Sabrina mentioned earlier that there is no one story. Right? There is no one way of thinking about America. And, that, and one of the things that really is uh, um, one is confronted with when one goes to South Asia, especially, which is what I'm most familiar with, is the question of diversity, not in the way we think about it vis-a-vis -vis race, uh, but, also, but perhaps religion, but caste, ethnicity, languages. 
in the ways in which you are living in this uh, society which has many different ways of understanding um, classic tales like the Ramayana, who is the protagonist, who is the villain, who, where do we belong in terms of our collective history. So you, one could have extremely opposite renderings of the community uh, based on shared kind of reference points in a particular kinds of ways. So I think it also helps to kind of really rethink for us as we are grappling with this idea of what does it mean to be an American and there's more than one story to look at other societies which have of course uh, other forms of hierarchy, it's not like caste is not there, like we have race, but how those societies have kind of grappled with social movements, have kind of tried to re-articulate uh, how to rethink the question of belonging, the question of exclusion or uh, access, affirmative action, which many of the countries like India have been leading us for a, for a good number of years, like 20, 30 years in terms of access, and how they have confronted with reactions to that as policies, particularly, and the rise of kind of conservative uh, reactions to those policies that have emerged. Um, youth cultures, which is what I'm just going to leave it on, what, a lot of what Fida has already mentioned, this kind of dynamic energy that is coming from uh, a lot of the new media platforms that are coming in from YouTube. I mean, right now, India and Pakistan, for example, might be having huge number of um, kind of, um, uh, 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 there's a lot of war talk going on, basically, around Kashmir. But on the other hand, there's also such a common reference point on Facebook and platform that you have one meme that would immediately transfer into India and into Pakistan because of the shared historical and cultural and media landscapes that have been made forged much more tightly because of the internet, Facebook, Twitter, where people are kind of making fun of the same film stars at the same time and being snarky about it. Um, uh, it's, it's kind of really rare for me to think of other contexts where you have two countries which are geopolitically being at, uh, are at this kind of at each other's uh, war positioning, but on the other hand, are also uh, have such a strong cultural diplomacy, if you will, uh, that is always kind of neutralizing that as well and creating a certain kind of shared um, idea of identity in a certain kind of way, in a regional way. So it's, a, it's an interesting way to like really think about how we might want to start thinking about our neighboring countries where we have really right-wing conservative politicians, but on the other hand, we have representations and cultural forms that are much more prominent, whether they're from Latin America or even, you know, minority or African-American actors or celebrities at the same time, this kind of schizophrenic ways in which we are kind of living with and how the youth cultures are responding to those, those uh, contradictions. So again, as I make generalizing, I'm always reminded by Edward Said, he's always my guide to how does one start kind of thinking about knowledge of other people. Sorry to have a big block quote, but I really like this. As an anthropologist, I have to remind myself all the time, how does one kind of get invested in the difference between knowledge of other people and other times as a result of understanding, compassion, careful study and analysis for their own sakes, and all the knowledge that's part of overall campaign of self as opposed to a campaign that is always about reference to oneself, right? Like those are behind, we are forward, they are telling us something about our own past rather than their past. Um, so like as I'm making this kind of gesture towards comparative um, framing which Asia really offers us as a very rich uh, way of thinking about diversity, very rich ways about thinking about global connection, but there is a certain way in which um, how there is this kind of way in which thinking about alternative could be one about thinking about it as a problem to be dominated or thinking about it as a other way of being that can help us to rethink ourselves in a more empathetic way to what's happening out there in a particular way. Um, so I'm going to come to my actual um, observation. I mean, we were divide, digging up different certain themes and one of the things that I really wanted to concentrate a little bit more about was the question of environment and the question of how um, questions about water and, uh, and irrigation and dams could be one way of us to really think about um, what um, natural resources, things that we take for granted and how um, examples in, for example, South Asia um, could offer us a way uh, 
for instance, uh, I guess one of the things that what I, I've been thinking a lot about is the question of, uh, it's become really, I mean, it's pretty obvious to all of us that there's no life without water, right? But we take water for granted in the United States because it's a simple matter of just turning on the tap for most of us. Um, although recently with events in Detroit and other parts of the country, one is beginning to realize that that's not a guarantee, but one is waking up to the fact that there's a whole infrastructure behind water and how the water, um, it can, we can be made vulnerable with it's whether it's a matter of droughts in California or whether what's going on in South Dakota right now, as most of us are familiar with, right? The, the large protests that are going on again, by Native communities against this gas oil pipeline that threatens the water supply for many of the Native communities and other communities, but Native communities are more organized, fracking and what that is doing to us and that kind of question. So there, for some reason, these questions that seem a lot removed and abstract when in South Asia and many parts of the world where the infrastructure is not as vast, um, as accessible, they are ever present. Right? The question of scarcity, the question of um, um, famine, uh, historical memory of famine, the idea of the energy demand and uh, electrically, uh, electric shortages that we have in South Asia and many parts of the developing world, which are not so common here. You know, everyone has a generator in the middle class household in South Asia, uh, if they can, or, or a UPS battery to run your house when it's, it's not something that's in common. Is that because we will never face that scarcity? Or if we do go away from carbon, do we have something to learn from how these middle class families have uh, pool their resources to kind of work with a uh, certain kind of precariousness of energy supply if we are trying to cut out, let's say, oil, cheap oil, and what that does for us in that sense, if we were to move to with that. And, um, so, but for me, one of the things that I wanted to focus a lot about was this question of infrastructure and water, and how water shapes and reshapes our social relationships, the settlement of people, how they relate to each other, because a lot of us are um, our, you know, water infrastructure is what is really creating the trust with the government. Once, if it, you're getting poisonous water, you're not going to trust the state anymore, right? In that kind of sense. Um, and the kind of hierarchy that exists where people are willing to pay taxes, willing for people to really to participate, if they have a certain kind of trust in the state institution, if you didn't, then you find other means, which many people do in South Asia, to access water. You hire a local gang or something like that. To, snatch water away from the water supply, you know, in that sense, it's kind of privatization of uh, water supplies that can happen. Um, so how does social domination of nature lead to the domination of some people over others? That's something that I, I've been kind of thinking a little bit about. Um, and so let me just kind of back up a little bit and just kind of try to uh, frame it, uh, just the kind of significance of water in India. I mean, the name India itself, uh, for many of you might know this already, <coughs> derives from a body of water, right? Uh, Indus, right? So that in, so for many people who uh, lived in western part of uh, it was a name that was it's a, again it goes back to this whole question of cultural exchange. How a name that was coined by outsiders comes to be the kind of native name for the country of people and the religion in some many ways of the people who inhabit the region of, of South Asia today, or who live in India. So Indus, uh, which is, comes from the ancient Sanskrit word Sindhu, which is the Indus River, was uh, pronounced as Hind in ancient Persian, and therefore it became uh, uh, named as al by the Arabs, and in Latin form it becomes India, Indus, in that sense. So that's how the word India comes into being in that kind of cultural exchange that it takes place, uh, particularly, and over time, it gets to be known as one geographic entity, which was known as different regions, different places, and different set of religions that had shared kind of deities uh, that become unified as one belief system, as Hinduism, and particularly a religion of the uh, people from that region in, in that kind of interesting way. So the river uh, Indus in that sense has this kind of significance that it is source of, if you will, the identity of the region of India. And ironically enough, the Indus flows through Pakistan today. It's not in India, you know, which is the kind of ironies of history and, and politics. And, and, uh, and part of that story is 
from the ancient time onwards, most of the kind of northern Indian civilizations have settled around the Indus Basin, or the Brahmaputra up here, or the Ganges, the Ganges, uh, which you know is a sacred river, right? And all of the water flow that is coming in throughout South Asia uh, in this region is all coming. The source of it is the Himalayan Himalaya water, the glacial melts, uh, rains, the monsoons that replenish. Uh, the, so this has basically been the source of, if you want to use a word like civilization or habitation, both in the Indus Basin and the indo gangetic Valley for many, many millennia. Kingdoms rise and fall depending on how well they were able to irrigate, depending on times of peace, and create large urban centers, granaries, um, and a lot of the kind of wealth of this region, which was renowned since ancient Greek times, was based on that level of uh, concentrated <coughs> agriculture and city uh, urbanization that it afforded. Uh, that that um, and that you know that kind of way uh, of um, uh, of kind of the agricultural wealth that was transferred into kind of grain agriculture, which turned into urbanization, was the source of a large scale trade that also is what has continued on from millennia till the 15th century. After all, this is what Columbus was looking for in many ways in the Indies, where he was trying to kind of create Vasco da Gama. The Portuguese were all interested in the kind of surpluses that are being generated in, the, in, in this kind of region and, and throughout. So the rise and fall of kingdoms, cities, and South Asia was connected to waterworks, and there was extensive irrigation works undertaken in the pre-colonial times, which supported large agricultural economies that supported the kind of economies that Columbus and, and the Portuguese also were interested in. Um, the colonial state, however, uh, throughout, so this is another kind of <coughs> explanation of how the Indus system worked in these like ancient uh, city-states, one of the art largest, densest kind of urban centers that were connected by trade to as far as in ancient times of Mesopotamia. Um, so this, this system would rise and fall based on climate change or wars that would happen, but by the time of late 14th, 15th century, there was this expansion of agricultural frontiers in this area. But when the British really <coughs> came in, uh, the colonial state expanded irrigation project and, and, and the ultimate control over water allocation was transferred from local communities over to something like the state, as we know it, the modern state, controlled by engineers and bureaucrats and not local communities. And what that really resulted in was the rise of a private property-based system that the British kind of created with the idea of land settlements. The transformation had vast consequences as people came to be ruled by a centralized colonial state that dictated where and how they would live by controlling water distribution channels and many parts of South Asia. The river turned from an organic, almost sacred entity um, into something that could be seen as a machine. Right. You can control it, you can turn it, you can route it, you can dam it. So it kind of, it, it, it's it become a much more utilitarian thing as opposed to something that you work with in terms of its rhythms um, of flood and non, um, it, it wasn't as controlled. So the canal irrigation really creates that network. The independence of India and Pakistan, I'm kind of speeding ahead, create another problem for this kind of, which is now increasingly seen as a machine. Uh, where a new dilemma, it was easy to divide the territory, sorry, I'm going ahead, but it wasn't, one can easily draw a line on the ground, right? And you can say, this is, for, from now on, Mexico, this is the United States. But how do you do that to water? You know, water just flows naturally, right? So what does it take to create? And the way in which the partition lines were created, so this vast irrigation system that was specially um, expanded in, South, in, in the Punjab, all the, the way the boundary lines were drawn, all the water headwaters that controlled this irrigation system were right over the border. Which is a very kind of cheeky thing to do by the British, <laughs> but they are known to do things like that. Um, so what winds up happening is that as soon as uh, 1949 and some disputes arose, India cuts off the water supply for the entire irrigation system. And the entire area is threatened with a major drought. And because it's an upper riparian country, even the Indus uh, is, originates in India, 
all of the water supply that's coming through what is Pakistan could be controlled and theoretically rerouted, particularly. So that would be an abs absolute disaster for that for the country and lead to many wars. And one of the first things that happens within that conflict was um, World Bank gets involved. The United States gets involved in 1949, 1950, 1951, and David Lilienthal, who was famous for the Tennessee Valley Act, um, the major architect of the you know, major irrigation systems in the American West, goes to India and Pakistan and tries to resolve the dispute, and World Bank becomes a third party rather than the United States as the first major kind of large-scale multinational water dispute that's being settled by the World Bank. And they come to an agreement by which um, Pakistan gives up its easternmost three rivers, the Ravi, uh, the Bias, which barely has any water now, and Sutlej. Um, it, it gives them, the east, two eastern rivers are given over to India. And it maintains control over the westernmost rivers of Indus, Chinab, and Jhelum, which are, are the water areas that are on the leftmost side, on the top. Um, and in exchange for giving up those three rivers, Pakistan is given massive amount of funds to create a massive dam, which is more than going to offset the loss of the waters, generate electricity, and create a much more controlled, flood-free, uh, famine-denying um, uh, kind of infrastructure in that sense. So here, the and Pakistan at that time is also being ruled by a dictator who is um, not elected, of course, but is very much seen as our guy in Asia, right? Yukon in 1915. So what happens in this compromise is the idea was that by creating this large uh, dam and new irrigation infrastructure, this new nation that is kind of grasping for a collective national identity, it really doesn't really has it doesn't really have a deep sense of nation, particularly. Um, can come together on the idea of one water system, one irrigation. It could be have a centrifugal element because and it, because this new dam will bring usher in modernity. It will bring in new kind of utopian times, and we will all be connected by one water system, particularly, and we will all be dependent on it. What happens is very interesting is the fact that people who are living in the lower riparian areas in the southern parts of Sin. Um, feel like the water is going to be completely dominated and monopolized within the Punjab, upper riparian. And the water, because it's being rerouted so much through the agricultural fields to make up for the water from the east, seven canals are built, what's going to happen is there will be no water going into the Indian, um, the, the Arabian Sea, and therefore the sea is coming into the ground back. So it's, it, it, you're losing um, your um, Indus Delta is dying, pretty much. The creeks are dying in that sense. Uh, which is something that's very similar to what happened in the Gulf of Mexico as well, with the Colorado River being tapped, and a lot of the uh, ideas about what is causing the droughts in America is also the mega dam of Colorado rivers that have kind of changed the way in which water flows and the long-term ecological damage. So one of the things that was really interesting is that this project that was supposed to bring the nation together gave rise to ethnic politics gave rise to ethnic differences in a way that became a question of matter of life and death because that's what water really represents in terms of livelihood and agriculture. So this is one kind of case example of how uh, kind of the ir irrigation politics uh, resulted in the politics of um, dis in disenfranchisement and, and alienation from the state in the lower riparian areas of Pakistan. Um, the other uh, example that I wanted to kind of talk about is much more uh, dramatic one, uh, and it's much more perhaps visible uh, to some of us who know about the anti-dam movements that have been going on in India in the last few years, um, which is these large construction of ma massive dams along the four major rivers in India. And this question of water control was central for India uh, not in the same way in Pakistan because it was not controlled by outside, but it was especially for this question of um, energy growth, expand agricultural zone, control flooding, generate electricity. The great, but at the same time, this is a very iconic image. This is the Demoter Valley, uh, one of the earliest uh, dams, and Nehru had this habit of going in and getting some of the people who had been handpicked as laborers 
to come in and initiate and inaugurate the dam. So this young woman, the 15-year-old uh, um, laborer who was specially selected to initiate the dam, and she comes from the Santal tribe, a tribe that had risen up in 19th century against the British who were forcing these tribal people into tea plantations all over the country. And this dam was going to basically flood their lands and their forests. Right. So after this moment and after this image was publicized and she was garlanding Nehru, her community refused to take her back in particularly because there was this kind of question of, and she had no idea what was going to happen, particularly because it was seen also as this uh, marriage ritual as well, uh, as well to the dam and to the, the leader of the country who was going to flood us. So the, this is a, a really, um, uh, I just I happened to have come across this image a while back, but it kind of represents the way in which this dream of this utopian future of dam construction and energy acquisition has also resulted in massive displacement of people and tribes who are usually made invisible uh, in the larger narrative uh, of development, modernity. Um, it's been estimated that large mega dam constructions in India have displaced anywhere from 3.5 million, which is a lower estimate, to as much as 400 million people, depending on how you account for displacement. Um, one of the most controversial projects uh, was this Narmada River project that you might be familiar with. The complete project would include a network of 3,200 dams uh, on, the, on the Narmada River and its tributaries. The first dam on the Narada River was completed in 1990, and it was reported that 114,000 people were displaced, and it ir irrigated only 5% of the land it was expected to irrigate. So, this is something that is um, a kind of a refrain, almost, that we see in various different iterations. Um, in 1900, there were no dams that were higher than 50 feet. By 2000, there were 36,562 dams beyond that. So if one dam that is that high can displace up to 115,000 people, imagine the kind of scale and numbers. And, and the dam construction that's taking place in places like China and India, these are densely inhabited zones, right? Uh, where there are cities that go back hundreds and hundreds of years. People who live in these areas have know how to work with the ecosystem. They work within the kind of livelihoods are tied to the land landscape. Once you displace them, the kind of uh, livelihood they can find or the kind of vulnerability they're exposed to is uh, is of another scale, right? And a lot of it is to generate electricity for fast urbanizing cities in Hyderabad, in Delhi, in big cities in that sense. So their displacement is often not very visible to the urban centers who are really clamoring for a certain form of lifestyle, a certain form of eating habits, certain forms of, uh, and, and so that is kind of what is generating this kind of dream of development based on that. Um, and, but this dream of bringing the nation together as one modern community through technology is, has this centrifugal quality where it's just spinning itself and throwing all of these people outside of the nation fold, right? As it's moving, and the idea was to have the centripetal form where it'll unify people and bring them all together, but it has created this kind of development refugees, if you will, right? And this is a term that's developed by Rob Nixon. Uh, and it's an ironic term that you are, have refugees from wars, you have refugees from displacement, but these are developmental refugees. And as I was thinking through this, and I was trying to relate this experience to our students here in your classrooms, uh, I was trying to think through what other analogies one could come up with that are uh, based on processes that are working with this notion of economic development that are leaving out and displacing people whose displacement is made invisible off and on. And one thing that, yes? West, West Virginia mountaintop removal right. that's destroying the watershed completely and, and, and actually boulders falling on people's houses and knocking Malaysia. them down. Yeah. Yeah. There's only one, then there's the West. 
Tennessee Valley Authority. Tennessee Valley Authority. And it's very racialized in America because a lot of the people who were first displaced in many ways were native communities off and on. But maybe another Tennessee Valley community, but I'm thinking of a lot of the, I guess, radiation and a lot of the nuclear testing that was happening in uh, Nevada and also in New Mexico that would often be targeting that. Uh, but I was also even thinking about the processes not in terms of environmental transformation of scale of a dam construction, but environmental transformation through gentrification as well. And the way in which how um, there is this kind of notion that this level of progress of this kind of transformation has take, take the logic is very similar about unifying and creating uh, a kind of a better improvement that will talk, bring everyone up, but at the same time is leaving these people out. And we rarely find out what happens to the people who are being displaced from neighborhoods. Where do they go? What is their history? How do they find their source of community um, again? So it was very, um, kind of, I started to try to talk about how Asian studies can tell us something about global studies, and I kind of ended up with this question of water as a central point of uh, contention and rethinking about how um, it shapes uh, social relations of hierarchy at times, right? Uh, in, in South Asia, and perhaps it has certain things to offer as you know, kind of analogies to what we are encountering here. Thank you. Uh, I remember reading an article about uh, China a few years ago about you know how much they pollute, but they also are the number one producer of solar panels. In the world. So, your uh, research, have you read anything about solar panel production or solar panel use, solar power uh, in India? So, I'm not that familiar with India. In Pakistan, they have invested in a very big solar panel farm, but it's not anywhere close to what the kind of needs are. And actually, Pakistan has done better in terms of they have been able to find the kind of coal reserves that they can actually exploit easily. So they've been using a lot of their energies coming in from hydropower and also gas uh, that they get from Balochistan, uh, which is becoming more and more of an issue. So it, moving on in the future, they're relying more on natural gas. And if they can strike a deal with Iran, which if America doesn't mind too much, <laughs> then they've had very good deals with them, but they're very worried about offending Americans. So if they can get good cheap uh, natural gas that way, that's the way to go for them. Uh, they have moved towards a ma massive solar panel, uh, solar farms in south of, there's a lot of sunlight right all over South Asia, but it just doesn't transfer over as much as the needs are growing. It's the fastest urbanizing city country in South Asia. I think that was years ago, I was at a conference at the World Bank with a bunch of my students, and uh, one of my kids asked, it was the ambassador of Denmark, and the topic was uh, global poverty. And, and my kid asked, you know, are we going to talk about population at all as part of this? And he said, no. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, you know, we're not going to go there. It's a very personal decision, whether it's a country policy or an individual, you know. So I just Googled, like, we were talking, you know, compare Pakistan to America's size and population. Like, Pakistan is about a sixth the size of the United States, with 150 million people, give or take. Well, yeah, India is a third the size with four times our population. So how does it relate population with water as incredible challenges that we have to, to deal with? Absolutely. And I think one of the biggest challenges that they're Pakistan's facing right now is this question of resource allocation, water, food insecurity that's increased more so than not. Part, but one of the things that I think about, if you're talking about in terms of population, control of the idea of policies in terms of boundary planning and whatnot. So one of those things that has happened is that there's been it's been effective at certain moments in history. Uh, you know, there's a kind of way in which there's been very directed public health kind of programs that are initiated, but there's not this level of consistency. But all in all, I think the data that shows that it's actually um, not only the state directed policies promoting contraception or family planning that is as effective as changing the kind of economic livelihoods of most people and the way in which they can tap into a different way of finding um, income. Right now, families do rely on extended family and other family members for support, for the kind of human capital in terms of agriculture. So even though agriculture is 
increasingly small and smaller part of the overall economic GDP. It, the invisible part of it is that a lot of the subsistence and a lot of the kind of food economy is based around this kind of invisible labor of children and women who are often working in this field. If there is a certain kind of larger transformation in terms of the economic um, kind of uh, arrangements, which has been kind of going backwards in the last 10, 15 years, if you want to look at it in the sense of moving away from agriculture, um, then you would have that transition. But right now, it, it really doesn't seem that that level, I mean, the, the statistics are very dramatically between the urban and the rural, if you kind of go deeper into this. If you look at Karachi and the family kind of sizes in Karachi and middle class households, or even informal settlements, is much, much lower than the kind of rural areas. So you have that kind of uh, situation that's unfolding right now. So I think there is a thing of increasing, those pressures are very much there. The question about dams as a solution, one of the things is that though, for example, the 20 ton floods, as horrible as it, and you might be familiar with those images, there were 21 million people were displaced, could not have happened if it wasn't for so many barrages and dams. Because what happened was the water was uh, pooling up and the dams were going to break, so they had to divert water immediately. And that's where the most flood affected communities were, all around the dams and barrages in that sense. And being in a, such a seismically active area in the Himalayas, uh, dam construction can provoke earthquakes, I mean, they could lead to result in earthquakes, and the sedimentation that comes from Himalayas, entire like mountains coming down the water, right, um, it leads to silting where dams are not going to survive as long as what the estimation was originally. It won't be 95 years, so they constantly have to increase the height of the dams to keep them, render them effective. Uh, from so those are some of the questions of, in terms of what are the solutions. This, this uh, echoes what topics that other people have talked about, colonialism, gender, labor. And I wonder if, if you or if anyone else can talk about the potential or the the practice of using some using these themes or these fields as an entry point to talking about general um, as an entry point to dealing with history, politics, culture, economics, etc. Um, but sort of looking at these subjects within area studies through a particular prism, um, like technology or any of the other ones, um, but. Uh, is, is that feasible? Has anyone done that? Um, I just, for me, I think, for instance, control over water, for instance, whether it's here or any region, really, uh, by shaping the environment, we're shaping ourselves, particularly, right? So, by um, um, the way in which the, the irrigation projects manifested themselves in parts of what is Punjab, which was a very pastoral, nomadic region in a particular area, which became this lush agricultural um, field in the late 19th, early 20th century. And that's where a lot of the kind of competition over resources when independence was coming up became a major issue in terms of where is this rich land going to land with? And, you know, our ancestors came in and worked hard and irrigated this land because the access to land and water was so centralized and so much controlled by the state, it mattered deeply who would control the state. Right? When the Congress Party, it became a question of life and death. Right? If, we, if this region becomes part of Pakistan, then we lose out. If this becomes part of India, then we lose out. Right? It, it became this kind of really intense, whereas regions of Pakistan where you had irrigation projects that were more controlled by local-based communities, not as much by a centralized state, the kind of modern area, you didn't have the kind of um, violence that we saw, and it, it's become you know it's become a case example of, of partition. The way it happens in the canal colonies, as they call it in Punjab, you did not see the same kind of violence taking place in other regions of Pakistan, like Sindh or, or southern Punjab, right? So there's a direct link there between the way in which bureaucracy. <coughs> irrigation technology and community identity formed together at a particular moment in history. And then other regions where these relationships 
work independent a little bit of the kind of state um, kind of projects, but they were much more based on local kind of communal links that were more resilient after that. So those communities, you know, slowly, like, uh, it wasn't 100% harmony, um, but it wasn't the same kind of violence that you saw in those regions. That's one case example that came from my exam, but you, there might be tons of other case studies. Yes, um, thank you for your presentation. It was wonderful. Um, but I started thinking about corporations and what the role is they play in this. So I know Nestle Water, for example, is buying up aquifers um, all across the world um, and then selling that water back to the people um, who originally considered the water theirs. Um, so now it's not just an ownership of water issue, but also what rights do corporations actually have in remote areas of Hyderabad or where are you going? And this technology is owning air. Yes. <laughs> I mean, Nestle actually has aquifers that draws from Cal drought in California. That's one of their sources from water. You know, where the water is being coming in from Colorado River for farming, they're actually getting here. And similarly in Pakistan, right? Uh, so one of the interesting things is also there's a partnership between one of the largest corporate conglomerates in Pakistan and um, and Nestle itself. So they make local partnerships. But more than that, it's much more visible because anyone who can afford it tries to get Nestle water for their home. So you don't, when you can't trust the tap water in your house, and the only way you can guarantee safety and security, especially if you have guests coming from abroad or the other tracks of town, more well to do then you buy the sleep water. Right? So it's, and if you don't have that capital exactly, then you are having that water that is sick, like water, water. So there is that kind of, it really has become a class divide. Water through the streets, rather than think this idea of water is a public good, it has already become commoditized. That's amazing. I'm reminded of um, the Millennium Development Goals that were mentioned before. Um, the next phase of the Millennium Development Goals that's online on the UNDP site is called the Millennium Project, and it involves sustainable Millennium Goals. So it's much more, and it's actually kind of the second line of that, where, for example, where the you know post-colonial dream of development has has you know has has run out of steam and has proved to be ecological disaster. And of course, it, we talked about silting before. Um, the silt that's not getting past those dams is causing massive use of fertilizer. And certainly, we know about it in Egypt, but um, but certainly elsewhere. So that original great benefit of the dams for creating these green spaces is now running out of steam and then you have situations in Asia like the Aral Sea mess from the cotton production and, and so it's just, you know, this is a really, really rich uh, topic and, and way of getting at, at modernity and the whole, you know, mandate of modernity because so often when uh, world cultures or world geography courses are taught from the textbooks, it's all about how modernity versus tradition and I think we're now having to sort of moderate that argument and our students, you know, really should should, should be aware of that trajectory from the immediate um, post-war, post-independence period. So um, we're coming to toward the end, but does anyone have a parting comment or question? Okay, it's after lunch and it was a really good lunch. By the way, that was from a Mediterranean Bakery and uh, they're our go-to people, as some of you know who are regulars. Um, I want to thank you very much, Mubashir. That was really, really uh, What I want to say before you all re leave, and I will use email, um, is that this is not supposed to be just today. The professors who've been here and their colleagues in the four cooperating centers, and we have several more centers that could also additionally be added, uh, additionally uh, contribute, uh, would like to make themselves available this is actually a university-wide project. They're, they're supporting this collaboration with teachers, with Roosevelt, but also with schools in general in the region. Uh, we'd like to convene, if you're interested, if you do curriculum development for this kind of thing, um, we may convene additional sessions with professors, even small groups workshopping things, you know, rather than sort of this broader format. 
So um, if you're interested, maybe make a note on the evaluation sheet that you would like to participate in further curriculum development um, activities in this coming year and, and even into the, into the present. And another component of this is we would like to uh, create relationships with schools so that your students can benefit from things that go on at Georgetown through the School of Foreign Service and other students. And our students, yes. And we were also, there's another second component is bringing our students, and there are some organizations we're working with on this, that will uh, be able to send our students, undergrads and graduate students, to your schools to be guest speakers and to um, you know, work, mentor students, all kinds of other things like that. So this is, this is more than the sum of just this day.